Unicorn Overlord is a name that is so dumb, it somehow loops back around into being great. I remember when the game was revealed, people went, is that really its name? And I was one of them, but I've come around to it. I am also 100% in a glass house chucking goddamn boulders because some of my favorite games of all time are called Octopath Traveler and Triangle Strategy. It just goes to show if you make a good enough JRPG, you can call it whatever you want, apparently. And Unicorn Overlord is more than good enough. It's damn good. Unicorn Overlord is a real-time strategy game. The gameplay is built around constructing squads of units with a good combination of classes and skills to deal with enemy squads. Your squads start at only a paltry 2 units per squad, and will eventually go up to 5, and the fun comes in finding out what unit combinations produce the craziest results. There's basic stuff, like having a big bruiser on the front row to protect a frail mage in the back row, but you can get some really crazy combinations as you experiment and get more units. And you get a ton of units. Not only are there around 50 named characters, but you can buy around 100 generics to truly build your army any way you want. The sheer amount of creativity allowed means that you can stare at the menus for hours, Frankensteining the perfect creation. Do you want to make an overall squad that can handle any threat and is self-sufficient, or do you want to make a specialist squad designed to handle one type of enemy and one type of enemy alone better than anything? The game does a good job of showing you examples of good combinations, but also giving you the floor to completely ignore the recommended build and make whatever fucked up creation you want. Make a squad of five armors and no healer. Why not? There is no god. And the flow of new classes never stops. You are getting new classes to work with from map one to the literal final map of the game. And amazingly, despite there being around 30 different classes, all of them felt like they had something they could contribute that other classes couldn't. No one class felt too strong, except Shaman, and no one class felt too weak, except Fighter. The class balance is very finely tuned. Every time you get a new unit, you can instantly slide them into a squad and start figuring out what makes them tick. No one player's army is going to be the same. The game is a well-balanced sandbox that yields thousands of potential results. And the battles with the squads play out, with every unit having so many active and passive actions per combat, and it uses a sort of Final Fantasy XII gambit system to determine what attacks they do when faced with certain enemies. You can give your archer priority for flyers, have your mages prioritize armors, healers prioritize healing after a certain threshold, etc, etc. If you're worried about the AI not quite behaving in the way you want, you can easily adjust every member's and the squad's AI before every fight, changing equipment, turning certain moves off and on, etc. You get a ton of freedom here. As the game goes on and you get more units with more skills, you'll eventually get 50 ways to play out any one fight. Figuring out the right weapons and skills for the job can be just as much fun as actually watching the battles play out. You can take a fight where everyone dies to a fight where you don't even take a point of damage. The other big gameplay mechanic is Valor Points a currency that goes up as you seize forts and towns, discover map items, and defeat enemies. Using a valor point is how you deploy your squads onto the map, but every single class also has special abilities that are used by spending valor points. They do everything from increasing your stats, giving you healing, doing area of effect damage, doing burst damage, slowing enemy movement, knowing how to use your units on the map is almost more important than knowing how to use them in combat. Do you use your valor points defensively by healing and deploying more squads, or do you risk it by spending all of your points on one big attack? It makes every battle super fun, and makes every map have dozens of right answers to it. It lends itself to creative army building, 
and even the enemy can start using valid points, so things get crazy. The maps themselves are also solid. Some are short battles, where you're made to claim just one small town, and others are large epics that traverse half a country, with constantly shifting enemy tactics that you need to work around. While commanding your army, you can use helpful items and freeze time to stop and adjust your strategy whenever needed, though the game does put a cap on how many items you can use depending the difficulty. The maps do a good job forcing you to use multiple units instead of babying up one super squad. Not only is XP scaling, meaning if you grind one squad too much they just won't level up anymore, every map has a time limit that will cause you to instantly lose if it expires, so that makes it hard to have one unit handle everything before you run out of time. Every squad also has stamina points that will get depleted. When stamina runs out, the squad has to rest and is incapable of moving. And if resting squad gets attacked, the enemy gets a huge combat advantage, so you have to use your squads well and balance the workload smartly. The gameplay is a fine-tuned machine that really scratches the strategy itch. Out of battle, the gameplay has you exploring the world and collecting resources to rebuild the war-torn nations. You gotta just run around and mash the A button on orbs to amass lumber and fish. There's some mining minigames here and there, and there are some side quests about exploring the map to find specific points. These specific points are varied and actually are kinda neat, because they mean nothing to the player unless you have the unit recruited that knows what to do with them. You want to fix broken bridges? Find the bridge man. You want to open those mysterious doors? Find the doorman. You want to mine the rock formations? Find the rock man. Not only does this use the characters you meet in a cool way, realizing that you've recruited someone that can help you explore the map is like when you get Surf in Pokemon or a new key in Dragon Quest. You just start running around the map to all the places you couldn't interact with before, and it is very satisfying. Though, the gameplay is not all perfect. The game is on the easy side, even on the highest initial difficulty. Not saying that easy games are bad, Sacred Stones is one of my favorite games ever made, and I'm not saying that you don't have to think or that there isn't challenge at all. But once you've got a good grasp on the game's systems, you rarely feel threatened by what the game throws at you. And here's the kicker. There is an unlockable difficulty that offers a really good challenge, but you have to beat the game first, and Unicorn Overlord is not a short game at all. My first playthrough took me about 54 hours. A 50 hour time sink to get a good challenge is just not worth it, and I don't know why they did this. You can change your difficulty at any time, so if they were worried about alienating players with it being too hard, then they would just change the difficulty. I don't understand this. The other issue, in my opinion, is that things can get really cluttered as the game goes on. The sheer amount of creativity sometimes gets mind-numbing. Every combat, you can change your equipment. So you have dozens of weapons, which give you dozens of different skills. And then you have dozens of accessories that gives you dozens of different skills, on top of whatever the class's skills are naturally, and it becomes a lot to manage. The game does its best to ease you into it, but by the end of it, it's just overbearing. It also doesn't help that the Equip Best Equipment feature is comically bad, so fights later on can drag a bit under the sheer weight of the game's freedom. But if the entire game does have one genuine flaw in my opinion, it's the town rebuilding system. Every town you save gives you rewards for helping them, and then you can station a guard there and get passive rewards. You'll find raw materials like stone and lumber, and you collect them and just give them to whatever town wants them. The game gives you way too much for doing this. By the end of the game, I had over half a million gold, dozens of powerful healing items. It's insane. It's part of why the game is so easy the first run through. 
I mean, sure, I'm only allowed to use 10 items on a map, but when those 10 items are all fool heals, that doesn't really matter. The writing is the game's other main issue, specifically the story. It's not bad, but it's also not good. It's very by the numbers, predictable, and just kind of exists to make a reason for war to be declared. The story is segmented into five countries that each mostly have their story arcs that are self-contained and don't interact with each other. This comparison is going to sound deranged, but it's a lot like the original Pokemon anime. You know how Ash will go to a new region, meet new characters, those characters will complete their stories, and then they're gone by the time Ash goes to the next region. It's like that. The main character Elaine goes to a new country, finds new characters, and once he's liberated their country, they fade into the back of your barracks for the next group of characters for Elaine to interact with. The fatal flaw in all of this is that Unicorn Overlord's story is something that I don't give a shit about. The story uses the same plot beat, that a once good person has been possessed and needs to be saved so many times. I shit you not, it's upwards of around 20 times they use this same plot beat, and that eats up a ton of the cutscenes. And the stories that happen when they're actually allowed to exist outside of that aren't that interesting either. I didn't really care about the Elf Kingdom or its problems, I didn't really care about the Beast People or their problems, and I didn't really care about the Angels and their problems. Drakenhold is the only place that I felt invested. Specifically, the character of Virginia was really good, and she has some great scenes. But only one-fifth of your game story being interesting is not very good. It does have some cool ideas here and there. Uh, in particular, there's a plot twist at the very final boss that caught me off guard, as well as a twist about how the game's mind control works, but my experience with the story was about 95% apathy, broken up by the occasional 5%, oh, that was kind of cool. Which is a shame, because the localization and prose of the writing is really good. I love the way the characters talk, but they just don't have a script to work with. I've seen stories that are genuinely stupid and obnoxious. This isn't that. I've seen stories that are genuinely morally reprehensible. This isn't that. It's just the most 5 out of 10 nothing burger ever cooked. Which is crazy to me, because the Rapport system, basically supports from Fire Emblem, have great writing in them. Seeing these characters in their downtime leads to a lot of charm and personality. Some Rapports are serious conversations about the character's backstory and motives. Some are silly one-offs that are just a goofy antic you're gonna laugh at and then move on from. And some admittedly are duds, but when you have a cast as big as Unicorn Overlords, that's to be expected. Honestly, the only part in the story that I was really truly invested in was the ending epilogue, showing what every character did after the game. I cared about the cast a lot, which makes the fact that they weren't in a story worth remembering just weird. I don't know how you mess up one side when you do the other side so well. But even with my complaints of the story, and my minor complaints with the gameplay, this is an incredible JRPG. If you looked at this game and even kinda thought you might like it, you're gonna love it. It's definitely a game I'll be playing again in the future. And at the time of recording this video, it's already gotten over 500,000 copies sold. I would love to see it go up there with Triangle Strategy and reach the million barrier. This game deserves it, and hopefully this video can convince some people to add to that number. Before this video ends, I would like to thank my patrons, including the likes of Adebayo Thompson, Andrew Crockett, Bean Juice, Benz Again, Dr. McBackstab, Great Riek, Hell on Heelys, Ichigo D. Camus, Jaeger Guts, Kenpachi Shiro Uzumaki, Kiri Amato, Kratos, Char Angel, Frederick Sears, Balsara Hakuman, The White Void, Jespacito 2, Lysevening Vault, Marth the Valent War Criminal, Morga Lorgan, Played Arrow, Shen Lu, The Fool, The World's Most Unironic Eight and a Half Tail Stan, Walmart Greeter, Ya Girl Owen, Grantendo Eleven, Drew Hack, Fire Emblem Lord, Ginger, Gugu Gaga, Cornelia Milkers 92, Maple Knight, and Upscale Furry Trash. 
Thank you all for your continued support, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.